So hello, good afternoon, and welcome to this session on uh, LLM program. I'm very happy to have you all for the session. My name is Raj Gopal, and before I go further, let me introduce my uh, colleagues who are sitting here, Arun and uh, Dolashree. So before we start the session, uh, why don't we introduce ourselves? Yeah. Later. So I work in the admissions team. I, I told my name, I'm Raj Gopal. Arun, over to you too. Uh, my name is Arun Thiruvengadam. I'm a member of the faculty of the School of Policy and Government in EPU, which is uh, going to helm the LLM program. Uh, very excited uh, to welcome the, the first pioneer batch uh, of the LLM program. Uh, my background is in constitutional law uh, and comparative constitutional law. I will be teaching the core course on law and development, which uh, uh, those of you who are joining the program will take in about three weeks' time from now. Um, so very excited and looking forward to talking to you. Hi, I'm Dolu Shri. I'm a research associate with the School of Policy and Governance uh, at APU. Um, yeah, I suppose that's it. <laughs> Thank you. So uh, I think if, uh, while we are waiting for questions to come, I think the viewers are uh, mm -hmm. uh, not joined. Uh, could we could we just talk about? how the program is structured in terms of the core courses, the elective uh, choices that they have. I did see that they have to opt for an elective even in their first semester. That's right. Yeah. And uh, the, the clinical engagement that you have and also the, what do you call the fourth one is dissertation. dissertation. So maybe we can start talking about that while we're waiting for uh, the viewers. Mm -hmm. Uh, so I'll start and maybe don't look in supplements. So uh, this is part of the new, uh, relatively new, uh, one-year LLM program, which uh, the UGC and the Bar Council have now uh, started uh, allowing in India. Uh, as some of you will know, uh, we traditionally in India had a two-year master's program. Uh, and the problem with that was that since many law schools in the UK and the US offered a one-year program, Many people preferred to go abroad, do a degree faster, uh, and then come and follow mm -hmm. whatever career option they did. So uh, the, this one-year program has been launched in India recently. Uh, some of the national law universities very quickly started their program, uh, and, and we've started it this year. Uh, ours is a slightly different one because it's a specialized program. It's not a general LLM. It's an LLM in law and development. Mm -hmm. um, but because the UGC and Bar Council regulations require us to have uh, some standard features in the program, mm -hmm. it is in some way similar to what is oh, being offered okay. in some of the LLM courses. What is uh, a bit different, and, and I'll get to the core courses. So uh, the people who will come in will do uh, four courses right. uh, immediately after joining. Uh, so there's a compulsory course on uh, or a core course on law and justice. Uh, which will be taught by Sudhir Krishna Swami. Uh, there is a course uh, on um, research methods, which is going to be taught by our colleague mm -hmm. Sita Ranka Karala, uh, and Sudhir Krishna Swami will also be involved in that. Uh, there is th this is the unusual feature because we have a specialized program on development. There will be a law and development course, uh, core course. Now that's mm -hmm. Uh, in the other required LLM courses, uh, this is not listed, but because we mm -hmm. focus on law development, that's what that course will set the basis for. Uh, in addition, uh, there is an elective that the students have to take in the very first semester. Mm -hmm. uh, now, this is where, again, the fact that we are a, a, a program located in a wider university gives students more of an option. Mm -hmm. So they can choose their elective courses from across the university in APU which means that they can draw from courses in the MA development program. Yes. There's one elective offered by the School of Policy and Governance, mm -hmm. uh, which is called the Foundations of Private Law in India. Okay. Uh, that will be offered by uh, two colleagues, uh, Nigam and uh, Shreya Rao, who will be also taking that course. But if students uh, have wider interests, they can take courses uh, from the wide range of electives available within the university. Right. Uh, and, and we will talk about this, the details of this a little bit more in the, in the initial phases. We'll uh, advise students on which courses to take. Perfect. Yeah. Perfect. Perfect. So uh, I can see some uh, viewers who, who probably joined in late. So I'm Raj Gupta. So Arun was talking about giving a brief introduction about the program, the curriculum structure. Hmm. Uh, if you're new to the format of a Google Hangout, if you need to ask a question, you'll see a green button somewhere on the right bottom of your screen. So 
type in a question that ask a new question button click that and uh, we'll be to answer your answer we're happy to answer your questions okay uh, that's it gives me an idea i mean mm -hmm. uh, more than them i'm also learning i don't know because uh, i haven't had time to <laughs> look at the program structure in that that detail this morning i was trying to uh, uh, get a hold so in terms of electives you will ha they'll have two or three um, uh, they, they they have a choice yeah. mm -hmm. of electives from when they can opt opt yeah. from uh, and the field engagement mm -hmm. is that something they will start straight away in the first semester or is it something uh, right so uh, so the azim Fendi university has a commitment to uh, field practice and that's the other distinctive quality of the LLN program. Uh, we have a year-long clinical program, mm -hmm. which will be divided into two courses. Uh, and so very soon after the students enter the program, mm -hmm. uh, they will be uh, given options. Uh, we have a range of options. Again, people can follow their interests. There's a okay. constitutional law, litigation clinic. Okay. Uh, there will be a clinic on environmental law. Uh, I think they, we are thinking of planning one on land law as well. Mm -hmm. So uh, we will shape the clinics uh, according to the interests of those who come in the first batch oh, right. okay. uh, and they will have the opportunities of working uh, either in a court case or maybe in a with an NGO on, on an issue which involves a legal dimension mm -hmm. uh, of any of these areas and we, all of this will be framed broadly from a law and development perspective uh, and they will sort of get to do that. So that's the, they, they will be doing coursework, they will have uh, a clinical uh, mm -hmm. program uh, which they will do across the year. Uh, and finally, as you mentioned, the dissertation component, mm -hmm. uh, which uh, doesn't get started immediately. They, they will be doing a course on research methods, right. uh, which will be linked to the dissertation. So for instance, very soon into that course, they will have to uh, present a proposal of what they will write their dissertation in. Yeah. So again, this is common to all LLM programs in India. The two-year program used to have a dissertation component which was done in the second year mm -hmm. uh, but now under the regulations uh, in this one year program the students also have to do a dissertation which can be uh, a bit daunting but mm -hmm. we are trying to assist students with that by making sure that we have very clear deadlines and manageable mm -hmm. uh, sort of timelines uh, and we will structure it so that they work through it across the whole year uh, and, and that's the other. so I think in that sense anybody thinking of the program there's a taught course component where they will go and attend mm -hmm. lectures and seminars uh, there's a component of field engagement or practice mm -hmm. where they will be working on a live issue uh, across the year they'll be writing reports for that so there they don't have to serve to do exams or term papers mm -hmm. but they have to submit reports of what they are watching and observing and learning mm -hmm. uh, and then there's a separate uh, dissertation track um, so it's it's a fairly intensive program, mm -hmm. and, and that's why we've been very uh, careful in how we've selected people. Mm -hmm. um, I should say a little bit about the the, the batch that is coming. Please, in. I think I think yeah, we should talk about the batch. The the people are watching uh, could uh, our students who are going to join us shortly. Mm -hmm. They could be people who are watching who are thinking about doing yeah. a program a program here. I can see questions coming in. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, but I think, yeah, we should talk about the batch also. I think that would be very, very important before we take uh, Daniel's uh, question. Question, yeah I, yeah, I can see. So Daniel's question is, what sort of work experience certificate do we show if a person has practiced independently in litigation? Okay, so it actually ties in very well to uh, the composition of the class yeah. uh, that we have. So we have 20 uh, very interesting, uh, I should say, candidates, uh, candidates because they're no longer applicants. They've been admitted Absolutely. into the program. Yes. Um, uh, they're from all across the country. Uh, they come from uh, various different law schools, some within the national law universities mm -hmm. uh, schools, but there are others also from uh, schools just outside of that. Mm -hmm. uh, and we've tried to ensure that there is a mix uh, mm -hmm. also of people from different law schools. Mm -hmm. um, there is very interestingly, uh, uh, so in terms of gender composition, uh, we have six admitted students who are male, 14 who are uh, female, uh, people from uh, all parts of the country, as yeah. I said. Um, uh, so students from Delhi, uh, Kerala, we are based in Karnataka, so we have a small uh, but good uh, cohort of students from who've done their law degree in, within Karnataka. Um, and as well as people uh, from uh, Kolkata, uh, Raichur, yeah. and, and other places as well. Um, in terms of background, and this goes to uh, Daniel's questions, uh, some of our uh, 
admitted students have uh, actually graduated uh, about seven years ago and then spent time in practice. And they've done a range of things. So uh, again, uh, so there are people who spent time in litigation, uh, some people who worked in corporate law firms or in LPO outfits. Uh, and, and I guess some of the older ones uh, wanted a, a change or wanted to just take stock of where they were going. And, and as is common, a lot of people look to doing a postgraduate degree. Uh, at the same time, we have fresh graduates mm -hmm. as well who've just finished and, and uh, want to spend some more time in a university setting before making up their minds about what they want to do. So uh, I'm, uh, we're all in the faculty very excited because it seems like a very diverse and dynamic group of people uh, and we want to uh, welcome them uh, uh, to the program. Absolutely. Super. So uh, Daniel, your question, uh, uh, I'm just trying to think through why you ask that question. What sort of work experience certificate do we show uh, if a person has practiced independently in litigation? Uh, we have a requirement or in the document that they should be submitting is to uh, submit a work experience certificate and a relieving letter. That's more so to ensure that they have handed over their current responsibilities before joining us. That's the, that's the idea behind that. We're not going to do anything, but if you can give a, your own personal affidavit, uh, that should be fine if you can give a, 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 a letter to the university. That should be fine, uh, uh, Daniel. Don't have to, don't worry too much about uh, getting a work experience certificate. Yeah. In that sense. So just to reiterate, so we don't require a work experience background to be admitted into the program. That's so right. as I mentioned, some people are coming here straight after finishing uh, their undergraduate education. Mm -hmm. uh, but in terms of uh, I'm wondering if that question has to do with the field engagement requirement. Uh, I, I don't think so, but even there, uh, if your question is about the clinic, what you will be doing is you will be uh, assigned to either a uh, lawyer or an NGO which is working on a certain legal issue, and you will also be involved with faculty here who will direct the clinic. Uh, and and there, uh, the assessment is through reports which show that you uh, visited uh, the field, you either gone to a court to see what's happening there, uh, or you work with an NGO on the side, and then you prepare reports about that. So that's that's as far as the clinical component is concerned. Daniel, if you have a follow-up question, please do ask. Uh, hope I've, we have clarified your question. Uh, Aaron, while you were explaining uh, about the program and the course, course structure, keep me right, I mean, I may be wrong. It looks like it's a, it's an interdisciplinary program mm -hmm. drawn from like the other programs that we have in yeah. development or the policy and governance. Yeah. Is, that, is that the same approach uh, in the law and development program as well? Yeah, yeah. No, thanks for that question. Yes, and again, this is probably what some of you may be wondering, how is this program different from uh, the other options you could pursue? Uh, so a lot of the people uh, who applied to us told us in our interviews that they also applied to the NLUs which is now become the traditional, um, so the NLUs are all uh, single discipline universities, right? So they are law schools, but there are no other schools in these universities. I'm thinking of the National Law School of Bangalore uh, or NUJS Kolkata. Uh, we decided when designing this program that we will take advantage of the fact that we are located in a wider university, right? Uh, also, I should say the School of Policy and Governance itself is an interdisciplinary uh, school. So there are some of us who are lawyers, and we had to be lawyers because the Bar Council regulations require you to have a certain number of lawyers before you can offer an LLM, uh, and, and four of us uh, have a law background. But even within the SPG program, there are people who come from anthropology, political science, uh, focus on public policy. Uh, and I, we think that's a strength. Uh, the kind of questions that come up uh, for resolution in India, particularly where so much of our legal, uh, our political culture has been juridified, and, 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 and so much is, so many important questions are decided through the law. Right? So we open the newspapers today, mm -hmm. those of you who read the paper today, the, the Supreme Court on what it has to say on Section 377 or Triple Talaq. So the court and the judiciary is a very important part mm -hmm. of how governance works in our country. Um, so the law then becomes in India perhaps more integral to that kind of discussion than it would be in some other countries. So the law is certainly part of it, but our, our understanding is that just knowing the law is not enough. 
you have to work with people who have an understanding of the political system, uh, of the governance structure, uh, how things work at the local government level, at the municipality level. And that's what we attempted. We, we think that uh, also people who have a traditional law degree will benefit very much from being in an environment where they can then uh, take courses with people from other disciplines uh, and then be able to work it. So uh, as you mentioned, you started off with the electives. Um, mm -hmm. In the first semester, they only have one elective, but in the second <coughs> semester, they have uh, two electives yeah. that they can choose. Mm -hmm. from. And there we will try, and because they also write in dissertations, mm -hmm. we will try and align the uh, interest of students uh, to uh, particular elective courses, which will inform their dissertation. Um, and, and, and we kept yeah. the numbers very low, yeah. very deliberately, because we want to provide that kind of careful uh, counseling and, and connect yeah. people to the kind of courses that they will draw from. Super, super. Number low in the sense that the, the, you're talking about the, the student the intake. Uh, yeah, yeah, intake. Yeah. So it's only 20 students. So when you said uh, while comparing with other uh, universities, mm -hmm. somebody who told me he was going to join, mm -hmm. he said, probably this is a place where there's no undergraduate uh, right. program yeah. in, in law. law. So the yeah. entire focus is going to be with all the, all, all the lawyers here, right. the entire focus is going to be on the yeah. LLM yeah. program. Yeah. Yeah. I can see a lot of questions coming in. Let me pick um, sure. you know, one by one. Uh, Right, uh, Priyanka, good afternoon. You're not, you're not missed much. I don't know when you joined. We just gave a quick overview about the program, how it's going to look like, but still, if you have a question, I can see a question coming in. Daniel, I'll take your question on uh, the accommodation. Uh, right, uh, I'll pick this. There's some questions on the admission process that's coming in. Uh, requirement to submit a domicile certificate, apply for the certificate is derived. Will that happen? No, no, not at all. Uh, if you have applied, if there is an acknowledgement, from, I mean, any acknowledgement that you have applied, just bring that. Uh, we'll give you some more time. So this is not only for the LLM program, across all the programs they have applied, uh, it will take a while. But that should be fine. It will not. It will not. So uh, let me pick Daniel's question because it's fresh in my mind uh, about the accommodation. So uh, we, we were not able to, Arun and Dola, we were not able to provide accommodation to everyone. We had limited uh, space in the, in, the, in the residences. So uh, what we've done is July 15th is where the second days are going to come. Mm -hmm. And that's the time they'll say, we're going to move out. Mm -hmm. And the vacancies will arise then. Mm -hmm. But until then, Daniel, uh, what we've done is we've some, seen some paying guest accommodation close by to the university. And uh, I can, I'm confidently telling because I went and visited one this morning. And uh, we will give you those details, but don't sign up for anything uh, long term. Once you get uh, accommodation in the hostel, one there are vacancies, we'll keep you informed. Okay. Uh, so get in touch with us. When you come here for the registration, there will be an accommodation help desk. Uh, they will guide you through the process. Okay. Priyanka's question on timings of the course. Mm -hmm. General, I know it starts at 8, 8 40 in the morning. Is that yeah. we're sticking with the same uh, yeah. uh, schedule? Yeah. Right? So, and then it will go on till afternoon, or they may have some classes in the afternoon as well. Right. So, uh, just on that, the schedule, uh, the, the calendar for the year is just being drawn up. So, by the time you come for your registration, and maybe at some point we will talk about that yeah. on, on the 7th and the 8th. Uh, when you come in for your registration, the academic calendar will be finalized and will be available to you. Um, at that time, you will be able to see. So, in the first semester, when you have the core courses, which will be sort of set, and in that sense, you don't have that much choice. Uh, but there will be some courses which start at 8 40. Um, the in the core courses they carry four credits uh, so they will be split into two classes per week so you'll have two two hour classes mm -hmm. in the three core courses that you're doing and i mentioned at the start uh, of the hangout uh, and you can find all these details on the on the website so you don't have to worry yeah. and, and we put it up as soon as it's available um so typically your day will uh, the five days of the week we, we typically don't teach on Wednesday afternoons for sure. And Wednesday will be a, a bit of a lighter day if at all you have, you know, because that's supposed to be meant for the field engagement component. So when the clinics start um, sort of working. Uh, so it, the, the APU calendar allows you to get started pretty early on a Monday. And, and then the Wednesday allows you to just uh, step away from the academic work. If you've got a field engagement, you probably won't have a field engagement 
obligation every Wednesday. So it allows you a little bit of breathing space. And, and since this is a master's level course, we want to make sure that students have enough time to reflect and, and go to the library. We have a very well equipped library, uh, which uh, all of you will see when you when you come. And, and the idea is to also parcel out time so that you can do your own research and study on your own. So it's not back to back classes, which is the norm in the undergraduate program. Uh, and we will space it out in that sense to serve it. And, and these details, as I said, will be available when you come for registration. Yeah. Thank you. And we don't have classes on the weekends, Saturdays. Yeah. Yeah. Right? That's that's a very common question that we get asked. Right. Uh, I'll, I'll pick Alfonso's question. She's mm -hmm. asking about um, how, um, how I've, the range of electives. Mm -hmm. we have. Alfonso, thank you for joining. Uh, thanks for visiting the university. Mm -hmm. I couldn't spend much time, but probably I'll come and meet you here later. Yeah. So the electives, I've seen the list, but is it theme based? Uh, I mean, how is it uh, divided? Yeah, I'll, I'll start and this is where Dola can also in, uh, contribute more to the understanding of the electives in the MA development program particularly. So, uh, as I said, we, we hope the electives will be the pathway to the interdisciplinary education that you were talking about earlier. Yeah. Um, so in the first semester, you have to take one elective. Uh, and and with from the School of Policy and Government, the elective that is offered is Constitutional Foundations of Private Law. Uh, which will look at uh, aspects of private law such as contract tort, uh, company regulation and subjects like that. But if those of you who are inclined to go beyond can take electives uh, from the MA development program uh, at, where there is a law and governance specialization. So there are MA development uh, students also who will be uh, okay, okay. taking electives along. So not only is the course interdisciplinary, uh, the, for some of these courses, the, the student base is also drawn from different disciplines. So, uh, my own experience, I found that to be a very enriching experience yeah. where, where you talk about these issues from different disciplinary backgrounds uh, and then get into it. Uh, and before handing it over to Dola, in the second semester, we are thinking of, uh, again, from the School of Policy and Government, there will be an elective on uh, law and economics. Um, and and uh, taking those of you who okay. have a dissertation with an economic sort of focus to be able to have a baseline understanding of the subject. Uh, there will also be an elective on welfare rights in India, um, which primarily looks at it through law, and that course may well have students from other programs as well. So uh, those are the electives which will be offered uh, from the School of Policy and Government. And the MA development also has so yeah, the MA, the MA in development program has like a wide variety of electives. Some, quite a few of them are actually cross-listed. So you'll have a lot of interdisciplinary courses like anthropology of the state uh, and public sphere in India, or discourses of nationalism, or uh, philosophical foundations of public institutions. Right. So we have a variety of courses that speak to anthropology, philosophy, economics, law. Um, development in many different ways. So yeah, students can uh, pick the electives that are cross-listed across programs. So that's the, okay, right. Thing, yeah. And I did see that uh, they have to do four core courses mm -hmm. and uh, three electives. Mm -hmm. uh, but that's the minimum. If they want, they can still do an extra additional elective. If they, they have, could, will they have time for that? Is that the right fit? Yeah. So the one thing that uh, I do want to emphasize, and this is not meant to scare off people, but uh, it is actually a very intense program. So as I was explaining the history of these LLM programs, uh, what has been done in India is the two-year program has been compressed into a one-year program. So if uh, you were doing, for instance, an LLM in the UK or the US, most of those programs don't actually require a dissertation. Mm -hmm. So the dissertation, which runs alongside across the year, is actually going to be quite intensive. Uh, so that's why people may have a range of, and you know, within the APU menu, there are also these open courses on painting and pottery and yeah, theatre, yeah. which will be very attractive to uh, our students as well, because in a traditional university, these courses are simply not offered. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think it's a question of time management, and it's a question of how much people want to take away from it. So there is the option of auditing courses, oh, and, yes, and that yes, we will, yes. uh, we will still continue. We'll with continue that. with it, and we'll encourage our students. But because the, the dissertation, the clinic, and every other program in APU is a two-year program. Mm -hmm. uh, so the students there have, have some time to come in and ease into it and understand that. The difficulty with this program is it's just one year. So yeah. at one level, it will start and finish much more quickly. And there isn't that much time for people to 
uh, you know, come in and, and spend some time getting used to. So in that sense, it is intensive, sure. but hopefully in a good way, we recognize that there will be challenges of people, especially coming from other states, to get used to the system, which is why we thought that we will keep the program small. Uh, and one of the things that we will do as soon as the students come in is put them in touch with faculty members, with graduate fellows and research associates, so that there's always people you can turn to if, you, if you're struggling with anything, uh, whether in logistics or in terms of academic support. And all that. But, um, but yeah, I would say that while we would encourage people to, to sort of see the menu options, you have to be a little pragmatic in terms of what can be done, uh, given the sort of limited constraints of uh, time. And, and thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Arun. Thank you for the wonderful questions that uh, you're all asking. But if you still feel there is a follow-up question, please do. Yeah. Uh, we have finished 30 minutes. We got uh, we blocked two to three. We got 30 more minutes to go. I'll let me pick uh, a couple of questions that have come in. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll pick Daniel's question, uh, the UGC uh, recognition one. Uh, Daniel, this has no implications on the degrees uh, offered by the university. Let me uh, start with that. Uh, the university was established uh, under the Azim Premji University Act of 2010 and uh, of, of the government of Karnataka. And this is in line with uh, the Section 2F of uh, UGC Act. And the degrees that we are offering uh, comes under Section 22 of the UGC Act and are in line with, there is something called a specification of degrees that the UGC notifies from time to time. Mm -hmm. And they have clearly communicated to us in 2011 that we are uh, empowered to offer degrees under, under, under that section. We have responded, we value their recommendation and uh, we have already responded to their uh, recommendation. And uh, we are waiting for their, uh, we haven't heard from them, we are waiting yeah. for them to get back to us. Yeah. Okay. Just to add to that, mm -hmm. uh, and Rajak has already said that. Um, so. The newspaper reports were not always clear, and, and so as Rajiv said, the legal basis of the university or the courses is not affected at all. What you, if this report had come smoothly, what this would mean is that if you would be entitled to UGC support and grants uh, and things like that, uh, that's something that uh, would have been good, but it's actually not uh, essential for us. We are a private university, uh, and which is fully funded uh, in its from its own program. So this UGC. Uh, compliance report would be critical to, to a university which is highly dependent on, on uh, funds from the UGC. Uh, that is not the case with us. That doesn't mean that we don't take it seriously. It was a good exercise for us. We are a young university and we were reviewed in this way uh, by these group of academic experts. So, And we responded fully to the concerns that we have raised. Uh, and we take it as something that will actually enhance our ability to, to advance our mission. So we take that very seriously, but just to answer, and, and the legally, the legal question is, it does not have any implication on any of the programs that APU is offering currently, including the LLM. Thank you. Thanks, Arun. That's correct. So I can see some admission, not non-academic questions. Mm -hmm. So it's like my forte, let me. Uh, I am just uh, selected your question. Yes, there is a transportation facility available. The hostels are very close by. We don't call it hostel. We call it uh, student residences. Mm -hmm. there's, no, there's no hostel warden. Uh, no, there's no concept uh, like that. It's quite close by. It's on the other side of your visit to the campus. It's on the other side of Hosur Road. One side is the PS campus. But we do have we do have bus facility. Uh, early in the morning after the breakfast, they'll drop you here at around 8:15, and then after uh, evening, it starts. From four, there is one. There is six. There is another. The, the library closes at ten. And there's one bus that leaves at uh, ten o'clock in the evening. So you have there is uh, transportation facility. Okay. Uh, thank you, Priyanka. Uh, yeah, Nikita. I just saw that uh, uh, the, the results will be out only in July. Perfect. That's fine. You can. You can. What you could do is you can bring. Uh, all the mark sheets that you have, you will have for all the first four years. So what will be pen remaining will be the final years. That we will give you some time, right? Uh, email center state the mark sheet needs to be submitted by July. So we will give waivers depending on because it changes from university to university. July is where we have uh, given uh, for majority, but we will have some exceptions depending on uh, where you are enrolled, which is fine. But please do bring all your mark sheets that you have till the first uh, four years. Okay. And there are, there are cases where we had to wait till end of August and uh, 
but we will verify that independently and the, where is the university or we have enrolled and uh, uh, when are the results going to be out okay right that's interesting internship requirement to be completed in the academic year uh, yeah. we did talk about the clinic engagement but i think is this, is that similar to internship can they intern with an organization is probably what priyanka is asking right so uh, priyanka i'm assuming you're thinking of internships as they exist in the undergraduate program right so in a five year llb or a three year llb program you have breaks and in that break you go and work with a lawyer or a law firm um so no we don't have uh, any such idea of an internship properly so called uh, but the field engagement idea is um, uh, that you work on issues that you find interesting. And uh, as I said, we will set the, the clinical program runs across the year. Um, and it consists depending on the area that you choose, whether it's constitutional law, environmental law, land. Um, and we, we will again, part of this can be designed because we are a small uh, batch. Um, we can design the clinic to align with the interests of the students coming in. Uh, and, and there are organizations uh, in Bangalore primarily that we will be reaching out to because it's difficult to, to work out the field engagement process with people based outside of uh, Karnataka. Uh, but even beyond Bangalore, if some, of, if some of you have an interest in working with an institution, that can be sort of worked out. I should clarify that this is not uh, with a view to gaining uh, employment. It may well be that you, are, you work with a lawyer or a, a, an NGO and they find you, your work ethic and uh, your talents very impressive and they make you a job offer. But that's not the objective. The, the, the objective is academic in the sense that you, you watch uh, how a certain issue is played out either in the courts or in a campaign, for instance, and you write about it. Right? But we, we do feel that that is what will actually distinguish uh, our graduates, that when they uh, leave after this one year, um, they will have had a sort of hands-on experience with a legal issue on the ground. Uh, and, and that will also give them a better understanding of the way the law works in practice, uh, along with the dissertation that they've written, along with the courses that they've done. So uh, I don't want to say in, in a very uh, sort of crude way that you will get skill A, skill B, but we think that this entire package uh, will allow people to have a well-rounded understanding of the law, which will make them attractive to um, to employers. And for our part, we, we do have, a, if your question is about placement, uh, that's something that's very much in the process of being worked out. Uh, as we say on our website, we, we don't have a, uh, a specific focus on where our graduates go. We anticipate that some of them will want to go into academia. So, I mean, that's one advantage of having an LLM that you, you become immediately qualified to teach uh, in, in a law school or in a university setting. So that certainly comes in. They, uh, the LLM also will make you attractive to employers uh, in the private sector. We also hope that some people will go to government mm -hmm. where an LLM is now becoming a, a good um, sort of qualification to have to work in, uh, say, the legal departments of public sector uh, or government uh, enterprises. So that's very much there. So, but if you come in, if you join and you have a specific uh, area that you want to go and our placement office will work mm -hmm. to try and place you there and develop their kind of links. Mm -hmm. Again, with 20 students, it's easier to do. If you were a very large program and some of the NLUs take in 30 to 60 people, that's more difficult to sort of ensure that that can be done. Thank you. Thanks, Arun. Yeah. So, like um, yeah. to both Anmol and James, I think that uh, you will be eligible to apply for the uh, NET after you're done with your NLM. So there shouldn't be a problem with it. In fact, we are thinking of how to support students who are planning to take up teaching, you know, after the program. So, yeah. They, they, they can. That's yeah. right. Thank you. That's next, Alphonse's question. Mm -hmm. I think we were discussing uh, some time back. Mm -hmm. BCI uh, recognition. Um, yeah, so if you look at the FAQs on our website, we've actually specifically addressed that. So uh, if, if you were part of this from the beginning, I, I told you how this course is designed. So the Bar Council of India has a set of regulations about what any uh, institution that seeks to offer an LLM degree has to do. So for instance, that is why we have a Department of Legal Studies. This was specifically created within the School of Policy and Government, because that's what the Bar Council of India requires. Uh, so that has some uh, 
requirements about the number of faculty you must have before you can offer an LLM. We comply with that. We, we have people on our faculty who have qualified uh, from the leading law schools in this country and have, have qualifications from leading schools in the UK and the US and Europe. Uh, so in that sense, that's not a, the other requirement of the BCI is the way the core courses and the electives and, and the credit weightage. So those are sort of technical educational requirements as well, which we comply with. Uh, as I was just saying about the practicum requirement, uh, a typical LLM today and the BCI doesn't require that you get practical uh, hands-on experience. We think that the clinical engagement actually provides that uh, and in a way uh, makes it even more amenable to the BCI uh, finding the program um, suitable. Right? So in that sense, uh, we, we are in compliance with the BCI's. Um, sort of requirements. Yes. Um, just uh, to add to what Arun had to say, uh, there is actually no requirement that the Bar Council recognizes a university for an LLM program, right? That requirement is there for the LLB program, but not really the LLM program. With the LLM program, the way it works is that you notify them that you're offering one and that you're compliant with them. And to that extent, I think we're fully compliant with the uh, BCI regulations. And as we see it, we see it as an asset, actually, that we don't have an LLB program. Mm -hmm. the, I, I have a master's degree from the National Law School Bangalore, which is considered even now the leading law school. But I, my own sense is uh, that as an LLM student, I felt that it was the, the sort of stepchild of the school. All these schools, the LLB is the star program. That's where their entire energies are focused upon. So we see this not as a disadvantage, but as an advantage that we don't have an LLB program. Uh, we are a place which is interested in research. We take a few uh, candidates because we see them as uh, people who are mature students, who, who have an undergraduate degree, who want to be brought into an environment where there's research and, and thinking about the law at, at a more sort of uh, at a higher level than in an undergraduate course where it's purely informational and you're just getting the baseline. Right? So in that sense, uh, we, we think that this program is an improvement on, on what exists in the country. Right? Thank you. Thanks, Arun. So uh, before we take next question, let me just quickly explain uh, how the next two weeks is going to look like mm -hmm. you know, when, when they should come. And uh, we, we have sent out emails, but just in case. So uh, July 7th is the day that uh, we would like you to all be here and uh, complete the registration process. Uh, that's a Thursday. In case you can't make it, send us an email. We will do it on the 8th. And the reason is you come here, you get into the accommodation, settle down, get used to the place. And on uh, July 11th, Monday, uh, we st uh, start the orientation program. It's going to be week long, five days uh, from Monday to Friday. And the orientation is going to be, uh, you will be, uh, it's, a, it's a common orientation program for all uh, master's program offered here at the university. But that we can understand, they will also have some sessions yeah. exclusively for the uh, LLM students mm -hmm. and then from July 18th is where uh, your classes will start mm -hmm. but it's important that you uh, you be part of that orientation program uh, but that's that's it's quite important to spend that one week here uh, not just get used to the place Bangalore that is uh, when I've, I've been part of the orientation program the way they have designed it I think it adds a lot of lot of value to spend that <clears throat> one week here and your sessions, I think you're introducing them to the library and, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. and things like that. Uh, so that's I, nice I just want to reiterate what Rajagopal has said. So again, this is where you'll see that the orientation is not just a formality. It's, yeah. it's actually bringing you into the wider uh, APU community because it's a common orientation across the university. So when you take that orientation in that first week, you are going to be taking it with in mixed groups you will have students from the MA in education the MA in development program uh, also being there and the orientation is led by faculty from across the university and we think that that will give you a sense especially those of you who are coming from law colleges which were fairly isolated or insulated or in the case of the NLUs there is nothing else you are only uh, law students with law faculty whereas here you will see what it means to be located in a wider liberal university sort of context uh, and, and that's, uh, we think, again, a, a special feature uh, of the program. So you spend that one week there, uh, either on the Thursday or, or, 
or the Wednesday of that week. We are just finalizing the dates for that. Uh, you will have a one hour or one and a half hour orientation to the LLM program where those of us in the SPG faculty who are going to be taking the courses will uh, introduce ourselves to you. We will also uh, tell you details about the courses and, and also form uh, mentor groups for you so you can reach out to uh, people in the SPG for any form of assistance that you may need. So please uh, try your best. Please don't think that oh, classes start on July 18th, I'll land up on 17th. Uh, if you do, you will really miss out on a crucial part of your student experience here. Uh, having friends in the wider community. Many students are, have been here for a year longer. If you make friends, it will also actually help in the adjustment process because they can give you tips on those of you who want to stay on your own or, or stay with other students. Uh, that's a very valuable time to, to draw from that experience. Thank you. Thanks, 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 Arun. And uh, before I forget, is that, do they have a uh, break, mid-semester break or yeah. something in between? Okay. Yeah, yeah. No, that's very much. And as I said, we, we will try and make sure that they're not. I mean, that's it's a master's course, and the LLBs tend to be very class driven. So mm -hmm. the tendency is from Monday to Friday, you're in uh, the school for all the periods. Uh, whereas here, uh, we will try and make sure that you have flexible time. So Wednesday afternoon, for instance, yeah. is time for that. And we'll try and build in time for you to also, because uh, uh, Postgraduate course is really a lot about self-study mm -hmm. and self-reflection, and, and we take that quite seriously. We have some constraints in terms of the BCI mm -hmm. regulations. There are courses we have to offer for it to be called a master's program, but we will try and uh, build in time for you to be also explore other things. Bangalore is an interesting uh, city, and, and, and hopefully you get to also experience uh, this, this fast-changing urban landscape that Bangalore has become. Uh, and, and will also be part of your education. So your education, not just in the university, but beyond it as well. Thank you. So uh, there's one question coming uh, on, on the clinics. You did say, mm -hmm. probably the question is, uh, what exactly are these clinics and uh, what do we do in them? Mm -hmm. so I think you spoke about the land governance yeah. clinic and yeah. the environment law clinic. Right. Uh, there's also going to be a constitutional litigation clinic. So these are the uh, there are four clinics, and you can find some of the details on the website where we've sort of listed what this will involve. So, what will it involve? Um, this is the the field engagement component of APU, and, and as I was saying earlier, I don't know if you were there earlier. This is the part which is somewhat distinctive about this program, uh, because any other LLM program, a one-year LLM program, does not require that. So uh, we want to make this a, a rich experience. So it's not as if there are scheduled classes and you have to just show up and do things mm -hmm. as a matter of form. Um, so we, in the first week that you're here, we will give you details of these. And then depending on your interest, as I was saying, we can try and see if, for instance, uh, you know, six or seven people say we want to do something on labor law, mm -hmm. uh, then several of us on the uh, SPG faculty and in the wider university have contacts in uh, Bangalore uh, within the labor, law, labor union movement, and maybe we can design something for that. So I would say uh, it's not something to get very anxious about. It's also not something, it's not a classroom engagement type. So there's no, there's, it's not like a weekly attendance requirement. Right? So once we design uh, the clinics in uh, consultation with the students, then we will also set norms for how to sort of uh, assess it. Right? So for instance, it may be that you will work with a lawyer who is dealing uh, with a major constitutional law issue and you're interested in constitutional litigation. Uh, well, then that will mean that you get in touch with that lawyer. We will put you in touch with that lawyer. Uh, and then you will be involved in the litigation, uh, whichever is working out, presumably in the Karnataka High Court, which is the typical place where such litigation will, will sort of happen. Uh, and, and that will then mean that you attend court hearings when you can and that they're not conflicting with your uh, classes. But you broadly stay in touch and you write a report on all aspects that you are able to see on, on how the lawyers are working on it, what are the ways in which they think of strategy, uh, what happened in court, how did the judge respond to it, and just your reflections on watching the law in practice. Um, and, and there are a couple of reports that you have to uh, write up, uh, and that's what will be the form of assessment. But again, that's seen as a very flex. I mean, that will be very different, for instance, from a, an NGO running a campaign. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we just had a campaign to ban the use of plastic bags. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and how did the NGOs go about? There's a legal and regulatory uh, component of it as well, because ultimately the ban has to happen through a regulation or a law. Uh, and people have to do sort of research on that. How do you take care of that? How do you take care of all the pragmatic 
uh, requirements to enforce that policy. So if you're working with an NGO, you would see those aspects. Your legal training will still be employed in that sense, um, but it could be different. Right? So it, this, the clinic also depends on what issues are live right now uh, and, and what the, the people we contact to, to help us with this process tell us uh, is, is on their table. So uh, we, we will provide more details, but I hope that gives an overall sense of how the clinics uh, are supposed to work. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah. Also, you may want to take a look at, um, you know, some of the hubs that have been listed on the School Policy and Governance page, because that will also give you a broader idea of the kind of work that we do and the kind of work that we actually encourage even our students to do across programs, right? Um, maybe a few experiences from the past clinic would help. Like, uh, for example, we had an environmental uh, law, uh, in, an environment clinic uh, in the MA development program, which was part of the law and government specialization, right? So, uh, in that clinic, students went out, got in touch with a particular NGO in a rural area, and were working with uh, the NGO through the semester. And towards the end of the year, they actually had a report that they came out with in some. Uh, I think they had this uh, presentation at the <coughs> Metro Center in Bangalore. So uh, clinics allow you to do a variety of things, but the way, so you'll be able to fashion the projects with your clinic advisors, right? So that's how it will work. It will not be a complete free reign either. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. And just to, I mean, Dola herself has been involved in uh, litigation about the right to education in Karnataka. And that's handled by the hub as well. So if there is a project that is going on, you could just be associated with that and yeah. you get to see this. And you also get to draw on the rich experience that many people here have in the field of the right to education. If that's an area of interest for you, uh, and you can sort of yeah. work on that. That's interesting. I think you said uh, we'll be dealing with live issues. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I can't find that that's the best way to be using law as an agency for social change. Yeah. Yeah. And that directly part of uh, uh, the action there. Good, interesting. I need to read more about. As I said, totally, I, I'm learning as much as they are all are. Uh, thank you. So uh, I'll take Daniel's next question. Uh, this is uh, quite a curriculum kind of mm -hmm. question. Yeah, let me sort of take it. So Daniel's question is, how much of criminal law would be taught in our course? Since you'd mentioned taught as a part of the course, right? So um, well, Daniel, taught at least classically defined is not part of criminal law. Uh, there are aspects of taught which can become uh, the subject of criminal law. Right? Uh, but uh, your question is a valid one. So the foundations elective, the foundations of private law elective that I mentioned uh, does not look at criminal law because uh, criminal law is not seen classically as private law. But one of my colleagues, uh, Nigam, is very interested in uh, criminal law uh, uh, as, as a subject. And uh, as we are thinking of designing new electives, we, we think the criminal law is a very important part of the legal system. It's uh, one of the vital parts of the legal system which is failing. So if you look at the website and spend a little bit of time, uh, before we started the LNM program, the School of Policy and Governance has been in existence. And before that, there was something called the Law and Development Initiative, um, which has been carrying out research projects on legal system reform, uh, on understanding crimes against women in India, the, the quantitative and, and qualitative aspects of it. So um, although the, the, the LLM program is new, uh, people have been in APU from its inception with a sort of law focus. And there's a lot of research which goes on alongside. So Doroshi also mentioned the hub, which is seen as a really engaging with the practical world. And we think this LLM program allows us to draw from that experience into an academic context. Uh, and and that's, that's an asset. Uh, but we also think that the clinics will do a similar um, sort of function uh, and be able to do that. So we don't have a criminal law clinic yet, but if, if you and, and there's a small group of people who want to do a criminal law clinic, we could, we could consider that. We have contacts with criminal lawyers uh, in, in Bangalore and Karnataka beyond, and that can also be done. Uh, in addition, you have the dissertation uh, component. So if you have an interest in criminal law, you can choose to write a dissertation in criminal law. Nigam, because of his own <coughs> interest and background in the field, would probably be a, a natural supervisor for something like that. Uh, but there could be others of us who could be involved. And you could do a sort of um, you know, a, a blend of, say, constitutional and criminal law issues. And then you could be supervised by some of us with our backgrounds. I, I would encourage all those of you who are uh, with us to spend a little bit of time on the APU website uh, and get a sense of the broader university, the faculty, there are about uh, 190 teaching staff now. Uh, and you will see from their programs, they come from multiple backgrounds. 
even within the school of policy and government, you will see from the profiles what the disciplinary backgrounds and training and work experience of different faculty members are. So uh, that will help you get a sense of, of uh, what the program involves. Thank you. Um, Thanks. So also, much. sorry, just to add on to Arun, I think um, we already offer a legal system reform elective course in the MA development program. Mm -hmm. So that's probably a way that that will probably be made available to you in your second semester, right? So that course focuses on looking at criminal law or the criminal justice system from the outside, right? So you're looking at empirically trying to understand how uh, prisons work, how legal aid works, how bail works, right? These are the kinds of questions that you would uh, look at. So you should really take a look at uh, the elective course if you have an interest in criminal law. Yeah. Thank you. Interesting. So. Uh... That, 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 I, the question that came is, so the clinical, this is probably my, the, the way I understood. So the dissertation need not be uh, what they're done in the clinical. Can it be? Need not. Need not. Well, it should ideally be distinct because these okay. are all separate components. But yours is a very obvious question that while somebody is working on a field right. engagement, yeah. they get these ideas and they That's want right. to sort of explore that. Mm -hmm. There is a timeline issue because the, what dissertation they will work on, although it is submitted in the second semester, the the planning and work on that actually has to start very early oh, right. in the first year. So it can't be that you have a field engagement in December and you suddenly say, oh, maybe I'll work on this for my dissertation. Right, right. If you already have inclinations and you've thought about it, mm. that could be something that you could do. You could choose. So for instance, if Daniel is interested in criminal law, uh, he could try and pick something in the clinic which involves that mm. and then maybe then be able to draw upon that in the dissertation. And right. We don't have a problem with that. Yeah. The only question is of uh, no double counting. And, and the project is sufficiently distinct for it to be assessed in two separate um, sort of, uh, ways. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks. Rituraj, I don't know whether you were trying to ask a question, but uh, you can ask us again. Nikita, I'm just picking your question. Uh, no, nothing is an overstretch. Uh, any, anything is a good. Would it be possible for students to engage in you know, more than one issue as part of the clinical engagement? Well, I don't want to say, even if you say it's a constitutional law clinic, uh, you know, it's only in uh, law schools that we study these subjects as single subjects, right? Because obviously the constitutional law clinic will not be only about constitutional law. It will involve a procedural dimension. Uh, it may involve a substantive dimension in another. So I, I would say to you that although we go with these categories of clinics, uh, you will see very soon uh, that every live legal question it comes to you with a mix, right? It doesn't come separately that, oh, this is the labor law issue, this is the environment issue, this is the cause. All of it is in the mix. Uh, for the purposes of making your job a little easier, we will say focus on one dimension of the problem, mm. right? But if you are interested, and obviously the lawyer or the NGO which is working on them is taking them all together. And if you want to follow that and take it, that's fine. Mm. Equally, we can help you. But just for terms of, and again, I must emphasize, you are, we are looking at a one year program. We are looking at multiple things that you have to do. Uh, hopefully, you can find a way to feed all your interests. But I would caution you in one. I mean, so wanting to register in two separate clinics seems to me uh, overly ambitious. So that's not an overstretch. But uh, and you, we will, if you're persuaded that you can take that on, we might be willing to let you do it. Again, this is not. I want to emphasize this again and again. Uh, and I think this is part of university education. But uh, in India, unfortunately, uh, undergraduate students had are treated like high school students. Uh, we want to emphasize that you have to own your education. So when you come in, we are facilitators to knowledge for you, and we will give you what the options are. But you make those choices. right? And again, this idea of making choices for oneself, even at the university level in India, is not very common. Uh, so that's why there are these range of electives. Within each thing, you can choose your dissertation topic. There will be no uh, uh, you know, list given of these are 10 dissertation topics you can take. No, it's for you to go and choose what do I want to work on. And we will not say, we will probably guide you and say, maybe have you checked these books. Mm. But it's not as if we're going to say, this is a, this is a dissertation, you can just sit and write it. Uh, that's for you to make choice. So a lot of this is about choices you'll make about everything. Right? What courses do I take? Uh, even within the core courses, we try and give you certain options in terms of how you'll be assessed. Uh, there, there are no sit down mandatory exams where you just have to uh, display your rote memorization skills. They will probably be take homes and they will have choices within them. Right? So uh, I do want to make that very clear that uh, when you come in, you have to be a very engaged participant. Uh, and we are there to help you go wrong, but we can't provide the motivation. So if you come in and you're looking at the 
minimum that you can do to pass this course, uh, you are probably, you know, uh, letting yourself down if that is the approach, which we are reasonably confident the 20 people we've selected don't have that approach. Thank you, Nikita. Good question. I think uh, I'll, I'll, before I take Daniel's question, let me take Anmol's uh, mm -hmm. question. Mm -hmm. You did touch upon that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I was actually wondering why is nobody asking yes. about the assessment? Mm -hmm. So I mean, these core courses are four credit courses. Electives yeah. are three credit with a transactor in the classroom. Right. Uh, we don't have a university-wide examination. Mm -hmm. And how how are you going to? How is the assessment yeah. going to be designed? So the first thing uh, I want to say is because the. The group is small uh, that of course has a lot to do with how you'll be assessed right so uh, each of the courses has a sort of continuous assessment component so it's not a hundred percent sit down exam as i mentioned i think uh, there may be in some courses a sit down exam if the instructor chooses and i don't want to restrict that choice but my own sense is that um, they will be uh, they, they're broken up so i'm just thinking back about the core courses uh, in fact the the APU uh, administration tries to emphasize that we break away from that road memorization model. So every course has to go through a process of approval within. Uh, and what is usually expected is there will be separate components. So let me just give you a sense of the law and development core that I will be teaching. Um, there will be uh, marks for class participation. Uh, we, we do take attendance, but there is no formal mark for attendance per se. It's combined with the class participation uh, grade. And the idea is that uh, we urge you to sort of participate both vocally and, and through other means. So you will be required to give short written comments, which may be on the readings. Some courses may require you to present uh, the readings uh, before your classmates. Uh, and then there's a class presentation sort of component to it. Uh, they, the core courses will typically still have exams, uh, but they will be different from the usual exam at the LLB level. So there will be a sort of take home exam, which will allow you 48 hours. So you don't have to worry about uh, memorizing things. Mm -hmm. uh, you'll have time to also choose. And, and so you, they, they won't typically expect you to do research on them. Mm -hmm. But the idea is that you have the luxury of time to be able to think and, and write and, and, and hopefully enjoy the process because it's, it's a challenge, but a challenge which is uh, hopefully one that can be welcomed in that sense. So that's for the core courses. When it comes to the elective courses, uh, again, a range of options. Some of them will have seminar papers, which will be the bulk of the course. So the advantage of an elective course is you will, on a particular topic, so Dula and I taught a course on welfare rights in India. So if you have an interest in the right to education um, or the right to food or uh, rural employment, the Norega scheme, uh, you, the course will tackle a broad range of issues, but you will choose a particular issue to write on and to do your research on. And we expect that students will, the, the paper that is submitted at the end of the term is of publishable quality. And hopefully then you can go and publish it in the journal. And at the end of your master's, you have not only a degree, but papers which are you know ready to be published with a bit more work on them. Uh, and your dissertation is also a, a year long sort of uh, scholarly work, which analyzes things and puts that together. So those of you who are interested in teaching careers, not only do you get the qualification for it, you also get preparatory materials for your publication track uh, and, and these courses will allow you to sort of do that. Thank you. Thanks, Arun. I think that's, that's a good summary. So it's it's continuous assessment. It's not end of the term assessment. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I also picked that even within one course, mm -hmm. in the, the end of the term paper, they can choose the yeah. theme that they yeah. want to add. Yeah. Trusting. And we'll hope that answers. But if you still have any question, do ask. So we are almost, it's we finished 60 minutes. I didn't, re I didn't realize. Uh, so if you have still have questions, do type in. Don't mind staying for five more minutes. Yeah, okay. sure. mm -hmm. uh, but I'll, I'll, I'll take Daniel's question and then we will uh, close the hangout. Okay. Uh, law and mental health uh, be an elective and there are chances of there in the clinical center. Well, it's interesting you asked that, Daniel. Uh, just last semester, one of the interesting things that I attended was a uh, talk by Jerry Pinto, uh, APU held a mental health week, I think. Mm -hmm. and, and there was a range of people who came and medical uh, professionals, they were uh, mental health NGOs. And that's an issue that I think APU has historically been involved in for a while. And I think that is an issue the wider APU community is going to work on. Within the School of Policy and Governance, we've had, uh, we have a couple of people, uh, one of our graduate fellows, Ashna, has a deep interest in uh, mental health issues and has presented papers in our internal faculty seminar. Um, and you know, if you have an interest in that issue and you know people are doing that, maybe, you know, for instance, we haven't talked about things which are on the website, but which are not directly connected to the academic program. So we have a 
uh, a lively faculty seminar uh, series where those of us on the faculty present our work to our colleagues. And if you have an interest in that and somebody is presenting on a topic that you uh, are interested in, you could get a special invitation uh, to attend that. that. That's something that could be done. Uh, we haven't yet thought of a clinic on law and mental health, but it, as I said, this is going to be also a student-driven process. If you come in and you say, this is what you're interested in, we will try and hook you up with somebody, and maybe that could be part of your clinical work. One option you certainly have, even without any courses on that being offered. I'm just thinking whether MA developer. There is, there is. I think mental health course, an elective course that's often offered by uh, Pensil, Pensil, which is part of the health and nutrition specialization, specialization. Uh, in the MA development program. So yeah, there are faculty members who are dealing with uh, and who are dealing in the area of mental health, and you can get in touch with them. Sure. One option you have is also to use. Uh, mental health law as uh, a topic for your dissertation that's or right. any paper in any you know course that's dealing with other, other broader issues right like i mean so yeah i don't think that there's a constraint in terms of not being able to learn it in any way yeah that is, yeah that's true thank you thanks Tola. so looks like i think we have answered uh, most of the queries thank you dola and arun uh, for being part of the session thank you for all about watching and uh, sending those very interesting questions uh, thanks for the team who are working behind the scenes, Amulya and Ansita. Uh, so we'll be back again with another hangout with more themes around education, development, law, policy, and uh, governance. See you some of at least uh, some of you will be here uh, next week. Until then, uh, goodbye and good luck. We have one last question. One last question. <laughs> <laughs> Expectation for the first batch. That's interesting. Okay. LLM course in law and development. Isn't right. it? Uh, we'll take that and we'll close. Yes. And, and that's a good uh, note to end on as well. Yeah. So um, what are our expectations? As I, uh, so this is, Alphonse, I think you, you, you are here and you haven't, you're the first student and I, I look forward to meeting you uh, soon. Uh, but as I was saying at the beginning of the Hangout, we are very excited about the group of people who been admitted into the program. We had a fairly uh, long process of admissions, which started in, in January. Uh, That's right. and, and we've had several rounds of uh, people because this is the first time we are doing it. So we've learned enormously in the process. Uh, uh, the people who applied to us were uh, from really across the country, from across the NLUs uh, and the various law colleges. Uh, and we, we had a difficult time trying to, and I mean, what became very clear to us is that there is a real need for a program which uh, which is sort of focused on uh, issues of law and development and we got uh, wonderful sort of responses from people in the interviews some of whom we could not admit because we have a cap on how many people uh, so our expectations from the first batch of people is not to sort of burden you with too much uh, most of you come from very i think the mix of people as i mentioned the the gender the the, um, the, the sort of diverse backgrounds that people come from is very interesting. There's a mix of people with a few years in practice, some who are fresh out of law school. We think that that group itself will have a certain dynamic. And it's important to remember, going back to this idea of owning your education, um, this is true also if you've been in an undergraduate place, that we, we sometimes don't emphasize enough how much one learns from one's peers, who are really, in many ways, wonderful teachers for us as well. So we hope that the peer group, and that's why we spent a lot of time carefully choosing it, will be a source of support and that you will stay in touch even beyond the program. Uh, I guess our expectation is simply that you try and do uh, the best you can to be involved in the various courses that we'll engage in. We are excited. Uh, you know, you, you are the pioneer batch uh, of this program. Uh, and um, we, we look forward to sort of working with you through the various uh, things that we've outlined. Uh, our expectation is just that you give it your best shot. And, and, and we are pretty confident that something good will come out of that. Yeah. Super. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Arun. And uh, thank you, Alfonso, for that closing question. So once again, uh, goodbye and good luck. And have a good weekend.